All right, we'll be starting here in Philippians chapter 4 tonight, just a, an isolated study the Lord put on my heart on prayer. Uh, but before we get to that, just wanted to make mention of something that I had announced somewhat uh, a week ago Sunday, uh, that in the near future, and I'm praying for the, with the, for the Lord's wisdom as I work on this, but it's my intention to um, put together a series uh, about uh, end time things and uh, to really help us understand what the Bible says. Um, many, many have been aware and are always thinking about what's coming in the end, but especially these events with Israel in open war, with, with nations rising up very vocally against them, nations that, by the way, are mentioned in Scripture. They're mentioned by ancient names, but they're mentioned. Um, Persia being India, and uh, we have Gog, Magog, and, and many believe that's a reference to Russia. And, and so there's a lot that's, that's really just falling into place that, that makes Bible believers excited and aware of what's going on. But I, let me just caution you, uh, be careful what you listen to. There's a lot of, especially on YouTube, there's a lot of really strange, and I, I've seen some of them, and just for the sake of seeing what's out there, I have watched uh, excerpts of different videos, and there's some real crazy, um, very unbiblical ideas out there that people who have a YouTube channel are just spouting off and misinterpreting Scripture. So just let me caution you, I, I understand a curiosity and a fascination with these things. Let me... Let me just give you caution as your pastor. Be careful what you're watching. Um, don't just watch anybody's video just because it talks about the, the end times and rapture and tribulation. Uh, be careful that you're listening to something that is biblical. And that's what I will seek to provide uh, in the coming weeks as the Lord gives me wisdom to put that together. So I don't know exactly when I'll have that ready. Uh, I'm doing a considerable amount of, of study on that. Uh, just pray for wisdom. Um, I'm looking forward to doing it. I've always thought it'd be a fascinating. It's a, I don't know if I'd say terrifying, if that's the right word for it. It's a really big study. It's a really intense study, one that a lot of Christians have disagreed on. Uh, a lot of Christians will disagree on until it all actually happens. And so uh, it's important for us to get a biblical understanding. And so just pray for me as I'm working on that, and I look forward to studying those things. So just wanted to put that out there, have you praying and, and also being cautious. Philippians chapter 4, uh, we'll look at verses 5 through 8. And the Lord really burdened me to preach on uh, us as a church being a praying, God-honoring church. The source of strength in an authentic church lies in the prayer life of each member. I've heard it said that prayer is the spark plug that sets in motion the work of the church as well as the keeping of our own hearts in tune with the Lord. We have to be prayer warriors. We have to be a people of prayer. Without prayer, we're missing out on that power. We're missing out on that connection with God that he provides, he promises to have, and he makes it available as a gift to us. A church that desires real fruit must be a church that practices real prayer. The early church at Jerusalem was characterized as a praying church. One of our earliest glimpses of this church was as they gathered for prayer in the upper room. Hold your place in Acts 4, I'm sorry, in Philippians 4, go to Acts chapter 1. This is shortly after Christ has given them a commission and we see uh, a different uh, aspect of the commission, some different things that he says here in Acts, but it's part of his final message to his disciples as he ascends up into heaven. In fact, in verse 8, we are very familiar with this verse, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So the Holy Ghost will come and empower them, enable them for the ministry of evangelism and fulfilling this great commission. And ye shall be witnesses of me, or unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So this was, there's, there's a lot going on in that verse. We don't have time tonight to unpack it, but um, he was essentially giving them a commission to go to these places, but also, I believe, giving a, a prophetic promise that these things would happen, that they would be witnesses. Ye shall be witnesses. And indeed, they were. We're in Beaufort, South Carolina. We have the gospel. This is the uttermost part of the earth, as, as related to Jerusalem. And so, God's word came true here. So, Jesus gave this commission. He 
he is taken up, a cloud received him out of their sight. And so they, they return, gather together in the upper room. And let's look at verses 13 and 14. And when they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. From the very beginning of the church until today, prayer has been the heart of the church. And it needs to be the heart of Victory Baptist Church. Whenever we see the fruit of God's work, there have been people behind the scenes, individually or in groups, praying and asking God to work in ways which they themselves cannot. If you have ever done a study on the revivals, specifically in our nation, but even some of the big revivals around the world, um, and if you haven't, it would be a good study to do. But preceding those revivals, what always took place? Significant prayer. People would take off work, and they would come and gather together, and they would pray for hours, pleading with God to work. Not, not just in everybody else's life. That's easier to pray for than for, him, for us to pray that he'd work in our lives. It's easier to look at other people, the whole you know, beam in the eye and such. It's easier for us to see other people's faults and see the need that God has to work in their life. But we, these people who are praying for revival weren't just praying that God would revive everybody else. They were praying that God would work in their own heart and then through them and others that God would continue to work. If we're going to see the revival that we're praying for, we need to pray. We need to pray for it. We need to yield things to God. We need to be serious about our walk with Christ. How, how seriously do you think God will take us if we're sitting here praying for revival, but we're not letting it happen in our lives? We want other people to look good. We want other people to be spiritual, but we're not willing to just cast out sin. In the book of Philippians, and I'll have you turn back to Philippians chapter 4, Paul challenged the church to continue walking with the Lord through persecution and to passionately pursue a close relationship with with Christ. I appreciate the things that Michael mentioned about, and I don't know the quote either. I'm, I'm familiar with the concept of what you were talking about, but I couldn't quote it any better than he did. I think he was probably closer than anything I would have come up with. But the idea of, of praising the Lord for the waves that cast him onto the rock of ages. So, in other words, like Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, um, glorying in his infirmities, the power of Christ may rest upon him. These people were being encouraged to praise the Lord in the face of things that they didn't really want to praise Him for. They wanted uh, perhaps pity or in, in our humanity. That's what we want. But God wants us to pray. God wants us to rejoice. God wants us to trust in Him. And we need to pray for the, those things that will enable us to trust Him more. And so as he's encouraging these folks, he particularly encouraged them in the final chapter of this epistle to deepen their prayer life. So the first thing I'd like us to look at hopefully that's not too small for you, is the patience of believers. Let me read all of the verses here, four verses, verses 5 through 8. We'll pray, and then we'll look into this point. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you'll give us wisdom as we look into your word. There is something here for all of us. There is growth needed in each of our lives. We all want to see revival, and I pray that you would give us the desire to see it in our own hearts and to help us to love you enough to seek that out by removing sin, by, by casting sin aside and turning away from it. Help us to love you more than we love our sin because so often we struggle and we fail. But if we're going to be a... a praying church, a church whom God hears, 
We've got to be living right and we've got to be praying. Lord, I, I ask that you would help us to seek that. Help us to hunger for that and that you would do great things in my life, in the lives of my brothers and sisters here and those who are watching and that through us you would do a great work in Beaufort. That we would reach our Jerusalem, that we would reach those people that we rub shoulders with every day, that we live next to, that we work with, that we do business with, that serve us at a restaurant, that we would seek to as we're going into the world, cast out that gospel seed at every opportunity. Help us to be a people who pray for those opportunities, a people who pray in trusting you that we would be pleasing in your sight. I pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. The patience of believers. Patience is not something that most of us enjoy developing. Have any of you ever enjoyed learning how to be patient, it usually comes through some pretty stressful circumstances and pretty difficult things that require you to just sit back and, all right, I'm going to trust the Lord. I want to, I'm chomping at the bit. I want to do something here, but God t- says to wait on the Lord. I need to, I need to be patient. These believers were struggling. These New Testament believers, we, we see the rise of persecution in our nation and, and continuing to rise looking ahead at and uh, you know, we assume that it will continue to get worse and worse as the end approaches. But around the world, Christians that you know, for centuries have been dealing with what these first century churches dealt with is a normal part of their lives. The persecution, the difficulty, we have not in our nation's history, for the most part, really ever dealt with it until recently. But these first century Christians, they never had comfy, easy Christianity right out of the gate. It meant leaving Judaism for those who were Jewish, for these, these Gentiles. It meant leaving pagan worship. It meant leaving families. In every single case, it meant separating themselves from the world, whether that was the religious world or the pagan world, both of which were headed for hell because they were rejecting Christ, and turning themselves completely to him. That required incredible dedication, incredible connection with God. And they... They received persecution. They had Judaizers coming around trying to pervert their doctrine. They had the Romans afflicting them. They had the Jews coming after them. All these people hunting down these Christians. And I don't believe you had churches full of of nominal Christians. You know what I mean by that term? Christian in name only. That's what nominal is. That's what a lot of churches today are. You have people who are, are Christian in name, but if you were to look at their life independent of their involvement in church you'd have a hard time seeing anything christian that wouldn't have been the case i believe for many of these people here and so they had to be serious about the lord they they had to develop patience and as the lord was working on them to develop patience they endured graciously if you look uh, in uh, philippians 4 and verse 5 let your moderation be known unto all men the lord is at hand how they dealt with Those trials, how they dealt with the people who were persecuting them, was a testimony. How they interacted with folks and how they continued pushing on was a testimony. It was known to all people. And the Lord is at hand. We need to be, as we are looking at that fact, representing that to other people. (coughs) Excuse me. And... Our life is going to go a long way in enabling us to be a blessing, be a ministry, and point people to Christ, the fact that he's at hand. We see things happening in Israel. And we agree with this last phrase in verse 5, the Lord is at hand. He's coming soon. People who don't know the Lord, they need to get things figured out. They need to hear about Christ. People need to buckle up because it's getting real. But we need, as we interact with difficulty, with trials, to endure graciously, to endure these things, to even look at the things around us without an overwhelming sense of fear, but in other words, pointing people to Christ. It's, it's easy, humanly speaking, to look at what's happening in Israel, look at what's even happening in our nation. I mean, people flooding into our country. We've got corruption in our government. We've got representatives that can't figure out what they want, and, and they're all a bunch of squabbling children that can't make up their mind, and, and we look foolish, and they seem foolish, and, and we're, we're nervous about wh- what's happening to our country. We look ahead at the next election. What's going to happen? Nobody knows. There are a bunch of people running that we'd rather just go home and retire. And we're nervous about a lot of things, and yet we need to just 
endure what's going on and trust that the king of kings is still the king of kings. And he will always be the king of kings, no matter who's the president of the United States, no matter who sits in the Senate or the House of Representatives, no matter who's on the Supreme Court, no matter what's happening in Israel or what nation wants to wipe us out, the king of kings is still the king of kings. And so we can endure difficult times graciously. Go to 1 Timothy. Hold, hold your place in Philippians there. Go to 1 Timothy 6. I'm sorry, yeah, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6. <coughs> but godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment, part of that enduring. Contentment is being, being okay with what God has given you, being okay with your circumstances, not complaining. Paul would say that uh, in all things he had learned to be content, he, he experienced great, great gain, he experienced great loss, he experienced great prestige early in his life, he experienced great rejection, and yet he learned to be content in all things. We struggle with that, because we've been raised in a society where we just get handed everything that we need, and then when we don't have it, well, we have a problem. Paul... <laughs> Paul says, in all things, with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So you know, that contentment, going along with thanksgiving, being thankful for what the Lord is putting into our lives, we, we ex can expect patiently. We can expect the Lord's coming. We, we can expect His presence. Go to Psalm 73. <coughs> Excuse me. Psalm 73. And verse 28. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. Whew, we need this today, don't we? It is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord. When difficult times come, we reveal where our trust is, don't we? You have people, and I was listening to a preacher today, and I really appreciated what he was saying. It's in light of current events. His message was from Sunday, but it just was put up on his church's page today. <coughs> but talking about how you know, people putting their trust in politicians and putting their trust in, in national security, and, and when those things are, are in question, well, then their, their personal sense of security goes out the window. That reveals where our hope is. Our hope must not be in a man or a woman. Our hope must not be in our military. Our hope must not be in our own security, which we enjoy, but it's a gift. Our hope must be in the Lord. Thou hast, um, <clears throat> I put my trust in the Lord God. Who's going to fix? Who is the only one capable of fixing what's wrong with our nation? God. It's not Donald J. Trump. It's not Joseph Biden. We know that. It's not Ron DeSantis, Nikki Haley, any of the others. Jesus Christ is the one that will fix what's wrong as he gets into lives, as people receive the gospel. And that is why we must be urgent to tell people about him. Because we don't have much time. <clears throat> uh, we'll, we'll skip Hebrews 13. You can make a note of Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Um, as we're going through patience, we are encouraged continuously uh, go to Matthew chapter 6 I don't have that on the screen but I'll have you turn there <coughs> excuse me Matthew chapter 6 <clears throat> and verses 25 and 26 therefore I, I say unto you take no thought for your life he's saying don't worry don't overthink it don't, he's not telling you don't don't think about anything don't prepare for anything don't worry that's the context here. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25, 26. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? There's more to life than those things. Behold the fowls of the air. For they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. <coughs> Excuse me, are ye not much better than they? We worry about things that, that cannot, we cannot control. 
In fact, if we were to look at verse 27, this is very interesting. Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit <clears throat> unto his stature? There, there are many who would probably enjoy that if they could. I don't really worry about that. My stature is fine. But the principle here, let me, let me bring that and apply it to today. Which of you, by taking thought, can be more secure? Which of you, by taking thought, can fix what's happening in the Middle East? Which of you, by taking thought, by worrying, can fix what's happening in Washington? Is your worry going to solve anything? No. It's going to actually make it worse, make you more miserable, and turn you away from Christ and to focus on the problems. And so we are encouraged that God will provide for our needs, and we can completely trust ourselves, our families, our present, our future, our nation, to him. In Philippians 4, 6, he says, be careful for nothing. Another way of saying, don't, don't be full of care, don't worry, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Again, with what Michael was saying, <clears throat> we struggle with the thanksgiving part of it, don't we? Especially when it's something hard, especially when it's something difficult, we struggle to be thankful. Because it hurts, and most of us don't enjoy pain. Most of us don't enjoy difficulty. We're thankful when everything is easy. We're thankful when we're coasting on smooth waters. But when things start getting choppy, we don't thank the Lord for his comfort. We don't thank the Lord for his presence. We don't thank the Lord for his peace, which surpasseth all understanding. We worry about the choppiness. If we don't have a proper biblical perspective, we look at what's happening around us, the unrest in the Middle East, the unrest in Beaufort. You, you may have noticed that things are getting rougher in Beaufort than they've been. It's easy to be full of care. Now, should we take precautions? That's, that's probably a wise thing. But sitting around worrying, does that enable us to trust the Lord? Mm -hmm. And so as the Lord brings things, whether they're difficult or easy, we need to be thankful <clears throat> and make our requests known to him. The prayers of believers. Oh, too far. Uh, let's look at the desire of our requests. If you'll go to Luke chapter 18. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> Luke chapter 18. <clears throat> I heard somebody one time tell me that that he believed that if somebody prays for something more than once, that it shows that they don't have faith. And I don't know where he got that idea, <clears throat> because the example we're going to see in this parable is exactly the opposite. Jesus is going to speak a parable here, and he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought once to pray? <laughs> no, that men ought always to pray and not to faint in other words don't give up just keep praying which is why we keep praying for some of the same people some of the th same things week in week out because we want to get to the lord's attention we want to see him work so he gives this parable saying this is verse two there was in a city a judge which feared not god neither regarded man he just did his own thing and there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. So she was wearing him out. Just nag, nag, nag. Come on, judge, 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 come on, help, 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 help. What's the point? Ladies, don't nag. No, that's not the point. The point is, you've got a request. We ought always to pray. Keep praying. Keep going to the Lord. Keep showing that you need Him. This lady had dire need of, of this, this situation be taken care of. We come before the Lord and we bring our request to Him and we just keep doing it. Because we want to continually maybe remind ourselves that we need Him, but also to show Him our dependence, show Him that we trust Him and love Him. So that's, that's part of the desire of our request. Um, <clears throat> I'll have you just take note of Hebrews chapter 4, but I briefly wanted to mention just some reasons that we neglect prayer. One of them is pride. I've just got three things written down here. One of them is pride. 
How could pride factor into a lack of prayer? Well, we just don't seem to think that we need God. We become self-sufficient. We believe that I can handle this. I got it. I'm not going to trouble God with this. I'm okay. Well, what, what are we saying when we have that mindset? We're saying that we're God. We're saying that we can handle whatever it is better than God can handle it. And so pride is a major factor in our neglect of prayer. Unbelief. There's pride, there's unbelief. Have you ever been tempted to, even though you wouldn't say it, to not pray for something because you don't actually believe that God can do it? Or maybe you have a prayer request that is really burdening you. And when we take requests here at church or other people ask if they can pray for you, you don't want to mention it because you don't want God to look bad because what if he doesn't or can't do this? Boy, that's a failure to understand God. But that unbelief causes us to hold back on praying and hold back on people getting to see just how good God is. I, I appreciate <clears throat> Debbie Elrod mentioning little Raylin. And when they first started mentioning her for prayer, Raylin was still developing inside of her mom. With the diagnosis that this brittle bone disease will very likely kill her. The doctors said she will very likely not survive birth. And she's five, six weeks old and doing well. Now, Debbie could have very easily, and she's not here, she's, she's at home, so pray for her. She's uh, battling <clears throat> sickness there. But she could have very easily just you know, prayed for that on her own, but not mentioned it publicly because, well, what if we pray that she'll be healed and she dies? Maybe God will look bad. That didn't stop her. One, she knows that God's not going to look bad. God answers prayer perfectly no matter how he answers it. But she made that request known. And the result is that we're all praising God five, six weeks later that this little miracle is alive. Contrary to man's expectation. Why? Because God is the great physician. God has all power. <clears throat> so our own unbelief causing us not to pray is, is wickedness. And then busyness. So pride, unbelief, and busyness. We just get so busy trying to do it for ourselves that we forget that we need to stop and pray. <clears throat> Think back maybe to Joshua, just after Jericho was defeated. And, and there's a number of things that probably went into Joshua's lack of, of seeking God when it came to uh, coming up to Ai. But they had just defeated the greatest city in the area. Tremendous walls that God brought down. And people will excuse it with science. But God brought those walls down just as he said. They come to Ai, which was a significantly smaller town. Didn't pose much of a threat. And he figured, well, we can send B team out. And they can go and they can take care of business. Well, as you study that passage, you'll see that Joshua didn't pray. Before Jericho, he had talked with the Lord. God gave him an unconventional plan, but he gave him the best plan, and it worked because it was God's plan. But he didn't seek God's wisdom for AI ahead of time. Perhaps he was too busy. Perhaps it was pride. They, he figured, we had Jericho. I don't need to bother the Lord. I know what to do with this tiny little podunk town. We can just go in and wipe things up and, and not have any problems. 36 men died. And so the result of that, whether it was pride or busyness, was... <clears throat> Those 36 men met their end. Their families had to go through grief. The nation of Israel was made to look bad. The God of Israel was made to look bad in that area. So we have to be careful that we do not neglect prayer. That, as Jesus said here in the book of Luke, <clears throat> men ought always to pray. And then the delivery of our requests, as we look at that. Um, go to Daniel chapter 6, Daniel chapter 6, verse 10, please. <clears throat> now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, the writing, by the way, just to give the context, the, <clears throat> the, the king there 
Darius was tricked into making a decree that, that nobody would worship anybody else or pray to any other god except for him. Now, this was concocted by a group of presidents and princes who were jealous of Daniel. They saw Daniel's prestige. They knew his heritage. They probably did their homework, and they found out that he had been one of the Hebrew captives from the Babylonian Empire. The Medes and the Persians ca- or conquered Babylon, just as uh, Daniel prophesied earlier in the book of Daniel. These guys were jealous. They came up with this because they knew his, his habit. That he prayed regularly to God. He opened up his window, and he'd pray. And so they thought, that's the only thing that we can nail on him. He's, he's squeaky clean. He has a great testimony. This is the only thing that we can get him on. And so they, they make this decree. The king signs it. And in those days, once the king signed it into law, he could not unsign it. He couldn't just throw it away. It was, it was law. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, <clears throat> he closed all his windows and he prayed a nice, quick, silent prayer. Is that what your Bible says? If it does, toss it and get a new one. The writing was signed. He went into his house, and his windows being open in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. He prayed no matter what. He knew that this could get him in trouble, and it did. He ended up being thrown into the den of lions. God spared him from that, but he wasn't about to let some measly little Persian government tell him not to pray to his God. And so he came with great urgency to pray to his God, to deliver these requests to God. We need to understand that God has a plan, and we can trust that plan, and as we pray, we pray for that plan to be accomplished. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. God has a plan here as far as delivering folks from temptation. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. <clears throat> but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. God has a purpose. Everything that happens, he's got a plan. He's going to draw us close to himself when things happen. When difficulty comes, God gives us a way to Uh, to obey him, to honor him. And he always has a purpose in everything that happens. Go to Romans chapter 8, verse 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God. That's a very important part of that phrase. This is not just a general promise for everybody, regardless of their relationship with God. You might not know God, but all things work together for you. No, this is not what Paul says. All things work together for good to them that love God. <coughs> Excuse me. To them who are the called according to his purpose. God always has a purpose. And that purpose, <coughs> if we went on to verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among, among many brethren. It was always God's plan that those who were saved <coughs> would be conformed to the image of Christ, would grow to be more like him. That's God's plan for us. That as we get saved, we grow closer to Christ. And so sometimes he'll allow difficult things to come into our life, not because he's angry with us, not because he wants to punish us, but because that's what has to happen to bring us closer to Christ. If you've ever dislocated, I don't know if you've ever dislocated your shoulder or anything like that, in order to relocate it, there's pretty intense pain to reset it. It hurts. But to get to healing, to get to wholeness, you have to experience that pain in order for us to become more like Christ and grow closer to Him. him, Sometimes we have to go through those difficulties and that pain. But that pain, ultimately, those difficulties, ultimately drawing us closer to God. We just trust that He knows what He's doing. And, And we'll move fast here with this final point, the peace of believers. Peace is a gift. It is a gift. And, and God is <clears throat> uh, going to tell us here about the, the guardianship of peace as well. It's a gift of peace and, and the guardianship. Let's go to Psalm 18 and verse 2.
We can trust in God's guardianship, His strengthening, His protection of us. And that gives us peace. <clears throat> let, me, let me start in Psalm 18, verse 1. I will love Thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength, in whom I will trust. My buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. We can have peace because we know that no matter what happens, God's got us. And we're going to look at that a little bit more as we continue on in John chapter 6 on Sunday morning, the Lord willing. But God has us. We are secure. We can trust in Him. You know, we, we sing the song, the foolish man built his house upon the sand. And being in a low country, we understand how important. In fact, some of us in the lobby before church were talking about the importance of foundations and and laying foundations and how so many foundations in the low country are faulty because they're laid quickly on top of marsh. You lay your foundation in the sand in something soft and it's going to fail. When we were doing a previous study, I showed you a picture of the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Uh, it did not have an adequate foundation. <clears throat> but when our, the Lord is our foundation, the Bible says He is our rock. He is bedrock. He is solid. He's not going to move. And when we build our lives upon Him, we can enjoy eternal strength. And we can have peace. We can enjoy the gift of peace. Uh, Isaiah 26, I'll have you turn there. <clears throat> and you can take note there of uh, 2 Thessalonians, but we will not visit that at this point. <coughs> Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3. <clears throat> Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace who keeps checking Fox News and looking at all the mess that's going on in this world today. Nope. Think what you will about Fox News. <clears throat> They're not telling you the truth either. You're certainly not going to have peace by having your nose glued to it. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee the mind is stayed it is fixed it is focused it's not going anywhere we are trusting completely in god and that can give us complete peace because we know that our father has us things around us may be blowing up falling apart and happening all you know, all kinds of things happening but we put our trust in god we can have perfect peace just as the disciples in the boat, the waves going all over the place, Jesus was there and they missed out on the opportunity to enjoy perfect peace, trusting in Jesus. They didn't really fully understand who he was. When he got up, he woke up, he goes to the front of the boat, peace be still, and it stops. Their rabbi stops the weather. And they say, what manner of man is this? They didn't get it yet. And, and we get carried away by all the storms and everything, the wars, everything that's going on right now, because we don't get it yet. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. If you don't have that verse underlined, you need to underline that, memorize it. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. <clears throat> Prayer is the privilege of every child of God. Prayer is the opportunity to talk with your father. Throughout Scripture, we see, you may be familiar with the term Abba. <clears throat> Abba is a term uh, that, uh, from what I understand, uh, Jewish children will refer to their fathers. It's a term of endearment. Uh, it's a familiar term, similar to how you know, my children call me Daddy. Now, I'm not suggesting that we call God Daddy. To me, that seems irreverent. But we, we can have that familiar relationship, not just something formal, Father, now, we call him Father, and when we do that, we do it respectfully. But the difference between somebody being, you know, formal Father and Daddy is a familiarity, is an intimacy. And while we call God Father and he reveals himself as Father, we can have that intimacy with him. We are his child. He loves us. He sent his Son to die for us is how much he loves us. And so we can talk to God. He's given us his word. 
He's kept it for us. It's how he speaks to us. Prayer is how we talk with him and enjoy that communion. And prayer is the source of power for the church. Without prayer, we may have much activity, but we will have little substance. We'll be all fluff and no stuff. We may have polished exteriors, but we will have little peace. Authentic prayer that seeks God's face and bears one's heart is indispensable to the Christian and to the local church. Just a couple weeks ago, I preached a message about praying for your pastor and and some of the needs that I have, the things that I need you to pray for. And at that time, I challenged you to be a prayer warrior. Have you taken that to heart? Have you determined to be a prayer warrior? You can clearly see the need for prayer all around you. Not just here tonight. I mean, we had a, a list of things that I put in our prayer bulletin. A number of people raised their hands and indicated need. And so we look at the crowd that's here tonight and we acknowledge need, but we look beyond this building <clears throat> at our community, people dying in accidents. We look at the rise in crime, even in our community. We look at the rise in crime and the openness of sin in our nation. We look at wars and rumors of wars. We see all these, <clears throat> these things that are happening that Jesus said would happen. And we need to pray. Pray for God's intervention. Pray for the gospel to continue going forth. Nothing will stop the gospel. War won't even stop the gospel. We have nations warring. We have blatant corruption. Christians are abused all over the world. And for many, all of this accumulates into a massive pile of worry and unrest. But for the believer, this ought not to be the case. We can be peaceful. We can be hopeful. Why? Because we are children of the God of peace and hope. We are told to pray, and I believe that there needs to be an urgency in our prayers. Much like Paul besought the Lord or begged the Lord, urgently pleaded with the Lord to remove his thorn in the flesh, we must make urgent pleading prayer a regular part of our lives. So in other words, it needs to be more than just, thank you, Lord, for my lunch, amen. If you, those of you who are married, tried to let that fly with your spouse, your relationship's going to tank. If all that I ever did, and, and, you know, busyness, life gets busy, and there's not always as much time to talk as you would like, but if all I ever did with my wife was just say, Hey, honey, thanks for dinner. Yeah, what's for dinner? Hey, honey, I love you. I say that every once in a while. But we don't ever connect. We don't fellowship. We don't commune together. My relationship with my wife is going to fall apart. How do we expect our relationship with God to thrive if all we do is just say, hey, thanks for dinner. Thanks for this food. Amen. Lord, help me to pass this test I didn't study for. Lord, help me to... Not get pulled over by the police officer who's right on my tail because I'm going 26 miles over the speed limit. Lord, please help this and that and the other. We, we need to make prayer a regular, natural part of our lives. It needs to be as natural to us as breathing. Many of you remember evangelist Bill Abbott, <clears throat> who's now with the Lord. Brother Abbott, he came to our church, I believe, three or four times and he was a tremendous blessing. I loved him, and it broke my heart to hear of his passing, but we rejoice that he is with the Lord uh, whom he served and about whom he sang. And one of the songs that he would sing, and I loved it, was When Men Pray. <clears throat> and one of my favorite lines from that song said, When men pray, when men pray, the heart of God is touched when men pray. Friends, let's commit to touching God's heart and being a people who are constant in prayer. Father, I pray that you would work in our hearts, help us to be committed to you, help us to be full of perfect peace because our minds are stayed on you. It is so easy for our minds to wander and to get fixed upon the news, get fixed upon the election cycle, get fixed upon wars, get fixed upon the border, get fixed upon health care, to get fixed upon anything else and everything else except for you. That's no wonder 
that our churches are in the condition that they are. It's no wonder that the American church is in the condition that it is. Because we just don't get it. Much like your disciples who were in the boat with God didn't get it when he stopped the storm with words. Help us to trust you. Help us to be a people of prayer. Help us to be a church characterized and known for prayer. May we never be too proud to pray. May we never <clears throat> get too busy to pray. May we never be doubtful of your ability to answer prayer. Help us to be a people of prayer, to get on our knees regularly, to pour out our hearts, to cast our cares upon you, because we know you care for us. You take care of the fowls of the air. You take care of the, the lilies of the field. <clears throat> and we're much more valuable than they are. Help us to be careful for nothing, not to be full of care and worry, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, to make our requests known unto you. Church, let me just ask you, as your heads bowed and eyes are closed. <clears throat>